Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. <laughs> late, am I, Lieutenant? No, no, you're in time, Brent. All that rain outside, I thought I'd never get here. Still coming down? Well, something fierce. And we can sit right here. Sure. Uh, how does this thing work, anyway, Lieutenant, this lineup? Well, oh, there's a sergeant now. May Felix I have your attention, up. please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. Step it up, boys, that's right. Right over here to the end of the stage, keep it moving. That's right, right over here, step it up. All right, now turn, all of you, and face the screen. Keep your hands at your sides. Look straight ahead. All right, number one, Jefferson Dykestaff, possession of stolen goods. Move right up there, Jeff. That's right. Where do you live, Jeff? Well, I don't know why you've got me up here, Sergeant. You ain't got nothing on me. Where do you live, Jeff? Oh, I've got a nice little apartment over on Sedgwick Street, sir. What number on Sedgwick? It's 1408, the second apartment in the rear... I don't know why you got me up here. You're charged with possession of stolen goods, Jeff. Well, I don't understand that, Sergeant. You should. The arresting officers report they examined a trunk in your apartment and found the following items. Uh, 227 assorted men's wristwatches, 143 assorted women's watches, 19 rings, three diamond pins, five pearl necklaces, 17 bracelets. Want to hear more, Jeff? <laughs> What's all that got to do with me being here? Most of these items are reported stolen, Jeff. They were? Where'd you get them? Get what? The stolen goods that were found in your trunk. Well, I don't know why you got me up here, Sergeant. You, you just ain't got nothing on me. All right, slide on down, Jeff. Number two, Ralph Crepella, assault with a deadly weapon. Step right up there, Ralph. That's right. Where do you live, Ralph? Freight yards. How long have you been in town? Long enough. How long, Ralph? I don't have to answer no questions. And you didn't have to slug that railroad detective with a piece of lead pipe. I saw I slugged him. Why'd you do it, Ralph? He had it coming. Why? The dirty fink telling me to get out of the yard, so I hope I beat his lousy brains out. You almost did. He's on the critical Well, list. he had it coming, a lousy cop. I hope he croaks. And that goes for the rest of you stinking bulls, too. I hope you all croak. All right, right. slide on down, Ralph. Yeah, you all got it coming, you lousy fink. Shut up, Ralph. Now take them clubs and them guns and what do you got? Just a bunch of lousy fakes. I hope you all croak. I said shut up. Yeah, I'd like to feel all your lousy brains out, you stinking cop. Get him out of here. Come on, I'm gonna do it, do you hear? And you're boy, the only one. I'll get more of you. Take him in a tank to cool off. Yeah, you get it all right. All right, number three, William Goodsall, open charge. Step right up, Bill. Take your hat off. That's right. Where do you live, Bill? Hacienda Motel. Sing out, Bill. It's a long way to the back of the room. Where do you live? Hacienda Motel. Where is that? Out of the 105th of Lexington. How long you live there? Three days. Keep your head up, Bill. Look at the screen. Where'd you live before that? Jennings Motor Court, Washington and Price. For how long? Two, three days. Say, hey, Lieutenant. What kind of work do you that do, Bill? Guy. Recognize him? He looks right. like him, all right. When's the last the, time? The guy that held me up. You sure? Yeah, ago. yeah, that's him, how Lieutenant. What kind of work, Bill? See how that scar in his you nose sticks out now? Oh, yeah, already. that's him, all right. Okay. What are you doing, Sergeant Cogger. Yes, sir. Hold number three. <laughs> Okay, Pete, let's go. Oh, took you long enough, Ben. Number three decided to copper. Didn't have to pick a bowling night. How'd you get him on? Restaurant holdup. 
Frank's Cafe. Over on Drexel Street? Yeah. What was his take? 16 bucks. Mm, Frank's business can't be so good. Mm, if you ever ate there, you'd know why. <laughs> well, hold it, Ben, Pete. No? Something up, Klein? Yeah, 211 shooting gas station at Harper and 67th. Captain Waller wants you to cover. Why, yes? The attendant's dead. <laughs> got here first, Trafton? That's right, Lieutenant. Me and my partner saw some car 62. We got the 211 flash at 817 and tore over. Who put the call in? A fellow by the name of Chalmers. He was waiting when we got here. Uh, that's him with Salverson over there. Want to get him, Pete? Yes, sir. I can pin down the time pretty close, Lieutenant. How's that? Uh, yes. I've been two holdups here in the past couple of months. We got orders to keep an eye on the place. We came by about 812. Everything was okay then. So it happened between 812 and 817. Yeah, that's right. The attendant dead when you got here? Yeah, that's right. Uh, this is Mr. Chalmers, Lieutenant Guthrie. Hi, Mr. Chalmers. Well, I'm okay now. I guess kind of excited, I guess. I never saw a dead man You before. put in the call for the police? You'd think I would have seen one at my age, but I never saw one before. Uh, you're the one who called the police? Yes, sir, I called in, Lieutenant. I didn't touch anything. I know about not touching anything. There's a pay booth over there, so I called in from there. Uh, how'd you happen to find him? Well, sir, I drove in here to get some gas. That's my car right over there, that 51 Chevy. Lights were all on and everything, but nobody was around, so I waited for a while, and when nobody came out, I got out of the car and went into the office. Mm -hmm. He was on the floor with all that blood around. I come out again fast and call the police uh, from that table. Well, thanks, Mr. Chalmers. Uh, stick around for a few minutes, will you? I want to ask you a couple more questions. Oh, sure, Lieutenant. Be glad to. I'll be in my car. It was kind of a shock. I never saw a dead man before, you know. I'll be in my car. Let's see how the lab boys are doing, Pete. Yeah, sure. Get anything from traffic? Uh, only the approximate time between 8.12 and 8.17. How's it going, Fuller? Oh, uh, hi, Lieutenant. It'll take us another half, three quarters of an hour. Quite a mess in here. Yeah, you must have put up quite a fight. At least three slugs in them, maybe four of them. Mm -hmm. And what's that under the ladder over there? Huh? A green cap. The attendants? Don't know. We'll check it at the lab. Mm. Must have been counting his receipts just before it happened. Yeah. And ledger book. Lots of small change and bills scattered around. Looks like whoever did it couldn't have taken anything. Yeah, only the attendant's life. Uh, can you come out here a minute, Ben? Uh, sure, Quine. Uh, this is John Pashley, Lieutenant Company Supervisor for the service stations in this area. They came down to see if he could help. Lieutenant Guthrie. I'm glad to know you, Lieutenant. Nice of you to come down, Mr. Pashley. Well, it's my job. Even if it wasn't, I'd be here. Brenizer was one of our best men. Oh? Well, that was his name? Yeah, William Brenizer. Been with us since October of 45. We put him on as night manager of the station here at Harper and 67th a little over a year ago. Uh, you know anything else about him? Well, let's see. Uh, he's 38, married. His wife's name's Mary. Two children, girl 14, boy 7. And it's going to be tough on them. Yeah. You, you know what happened here yet? Well, it looks like an attempted robbery. The brothers are trying to put up a fight. Yeah, but our men are all warned not to resist if any such attempts are made, Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the inside of that office? Mm -hmm. I guess there was a struggle, all right, but I didn't think Brenizer would put up a fight. Well, why not? He thought too much of his wife and kids. He'd been trying to get off night work because of them. Asked for a transfer to a day job upstate. Mm. Too bad he didn't get it. Well, he did. He was going up there next week. Hate this job. Yeah. Somebody's got to do it. Sure is a lousy night. Yeah. Hello there. Mrs. Brenneser? That's right. Uh, we're police officers. Uh, could we talk to you for a minute, please? Why, sure. Come in out of that rain. Thanks. Do you mind coming back to the kitchen? I've got some pies in the oven. I don't want them to burn. Well, sure. You're a policeman, you say? Uh, that's right, Mrs. Brenneser. Friends of Bill's, are you? Well, not exactly. Excuse you... me a minute. I want to check those pies. I'm baking some apple pies. They're Bill's favorites. He'll be home in a little while, and he loves hot apple pie when he comes home. Yeah, I'll be ready in a minute. I thought maybe you were those two squad car men who ride around near the gas station. No, we're not them. Bill's told me about them, how they sort of keep an eye on the place. Makes me feel better knowing they're around. Bill working nights and all, you know. Uh, Mrs. Brenner, sir, there, there was some trouble down at the Phyllis station tonight. Trouble? Attempted holdup. Bill, something's happened to... What's happened? Tell me, what's happened? Your husband was shot, Mrs. Brenner. Shot? 
Bill shot? Yes, ma'am. No. It couldn't be. Where is he? I've got to get to him. Where is he? Bill's dead, isn't he? Dead? Yes, ma'am. He promised me he wouldn't fight. If anybody tried to hold him up. He promised. And we're leaving next week. He's being transferred to a new job upstate. He won't have to work nights anymore. He won't have to work nights. Excuse me, please. Hi, I think they're burning. Sure. The children were looking forward to it. Having their daddy home for dinner. They've missed that. Not having their daddy home for dinner. Tomorrow night, most of these same CBS stations will present another lineup, a great lineup of musical shows. The Jack Smith Dinah Shore Show, The Peggy Lee Show, The Doris Day Show, and The Bing Crosby Show, with Jimmy Stewart as Bing's special guest. So, for a great musical lineup, be with CBS tomorrow night. <laughs> Hi, Pete. Here's ballistics report on the slugs that killed Brenizer, Ben. Oh, good. Let's see. Him. 32 caliber automatic fired from foreign smokeless cartridge cases. Foreign? Yeah. Bricker says probably a Belgian make. Uh-huh. The automatic used at right-hand rifling. Anything on record that matches? Oh, nothing. Ah, there wouldn't be. You get the autopsy report? There it is. One bullet wound, vicinity right temple. One just to the left of the spine at the shoulder blade. One at the shoulder joint. Another below the armpit to the rear. One eye badly bruised. Four shots. Three in the back. Uh-huh. How do you figure it happened? Well, Brenizer must have started counting his receipts around 8 o'clock. 8.05, Traft and Salveson came by in car 62. A couple of minutes later, somebody walked in with a gun. Must have cased the joint. Knew about 62 and waited till it got clear. Yeah, it could be. Brenezer put up a fight for a while. And that's when the ladder turned over and the killer lost his cap. Are you sure the cap wasn't Brenezer's? His wife and brother-in-law say no. Hmm. Oh, you want some coffee, Ben? Yeah, not now. Hey, what about all those shots? Well, Brenezer must have tried to break away. That's when he got the three in the back. And the fourth one in the temple after he hit the deck? Yeah. Ah, there wasn't any hold-up, Ben. No. Something's phony. Has to be. All those shots, no money taken. Brenizer puts up a fight when company orders are to relax. <laughs> Must be great to work out a homicide. Nothing to do but guzzle coffee all day. Uh, different in the lab, huh, Fuller? Yeah, you know it. Sure. Slaving all day over a hot pinochle deck. Uh, you should live so long. What have you got for us on that cap, Fuller? Well, it's size six and seven eighths. The taping is unusual. 50% cotton, 50% wool. Cap was made on two types of sewing machines. One was a singer, single needle, number 24-7. The other a singer, double needle, number 24-36. Yeah, boiled down, what does that mean? You shouldn't have any trouble running down the manufacturer. Mm, anything else? I suppose you'd like a description of the killer. Well, that'd help. You might try looking for a young white male with medium brown straight hair. Yeah, thanks, we will. Pete, mm -hmm. take McDonald's, Sloan, Asher, and Quai and make the rounds of the cap manufacturers. Find out who made that cap, what store handled it, who bought it. Right. I'll check with Brenner's family. Uh, look for another motor besides robbery. Guthrie. It's Klein, Ben. Hey, what's up? Got another gas station job like Brenner's. They got one of the guys who did it. Hi, Ben. Hi. Another Brenner's deal, all right? Stick up, shooting, no dough taken. The attendant dead? Yeah. Two punks pulled the job. Lieutenant shot one of them before he died. Other one got away. He was wearing a green cap then. 
The twin of the one we found at Brennan's. Uh, where's the one who was shot? Over there. They're loading him into the ambulance. Now, let's get home. Sure. He's a bad way to figure he'll Easy, be DLA. Uh, Easy. Don't can he talk? Him. Little. Doesn't make much sense. Okay. That does it. Let's get moving, Mike. How is he, Doc? Uh, don't bet on him. Can he talk? And nothing can hurt him now. Uh, I'll ride along, all right? Sure, hop in. Uh, bring back my car, Pete. Okay, Ben. Let's go, Mike. Uh, help yourself, Lieutenant. All I can do is push some saline solution into him. Okay, Dan. What's your name, Mac? Can you hear me? What's your name? Trigger Happy. Ozzy. Punk. Trigger Happy. Who's Trigger Happy? Hold him. Gotta have dough. It's a sense to shoot. <laughs> Gotta have dough. You... You a cop? That's right. Did you shoot down that station attendant? Have, have, am I going to die? Have, am I? Let's get at that arm, huh, Lieutenant. Yeah, sure. Have, am I going to die? I don't want, want to die. Who gunned down that attendant? <laughs> Torch. Trigger happy punk. Torchy who? Don't know. Last name. Steve, something. Gunned him down. Where can I find him? Don't want to die. Where does Torchy work? Garage. What garage? Just shooting all he wants. No, no dough. Shooting. What garage? I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to... Let me get that needle out, Lieutenant. No use wasting any more of this stuff. Who's covering the garages, Ben? Burton and Marzani. They got a squad each. Lots of garages in town. Yeah, lots of guys by the name of Steve, too. Yeah. Anything on the caps? The quine should be in soon with a preliminary report. How are you making out on the grudge motive? Family says nothing doing. I have a call in for Pashley. Brenner's his boss at the oil company? Yeah. Hey, uh, what about ballistics? No report yet. But I'll give you eight to five the same type slugs kill both men. <laughs> no bet. Yeah. Guthrie? This is Pashley, Lieutenant. Sir, I got that message you left for me. I think you might have something there. Uh, how's that, Pashley? Well, I hadn't thought of it until I got your message, but Renizer was going to be transferred upstate next week. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, he had an assistant working for him at the station, a young kid around 19. He, he thought he ought to get Renizer's job. But Renizer wouldn't recommend him, though. Too unreliable. They threw a few punches about it. Oh, uh, what's this man's name? Oh, I went along with Renizer, of course. Had to fire the boy. He blamed Renizer for it. Said something about getting even. Uh, what's his name? Oh, I looked it up as soon as I got your message. It's Warren. Steve Warren. He's a pretty unsteady kid emotionally. No, I'm bad. Do they ever call him Torchy? Oh, that I wouldn't know. You got an address for him? Yeah, we have, but it's no good. Well, how's that? Mailed out his severance pay and it came back unknown at that address. Oh. Well, what about references? Relatives? Anything like that? I might have something better for you. What? Well, one of the boys here ran into him a couple of days ago. Said he was working at Rutgers Garage. 1900 block on Halverson. You think that might help? It might. Okay, Pete. Nobody's come out here. And Warren's still in there. What's the pitch? Honnold and Travis have the exit ramps covered. Burton at the rear door, Johnson Ashner at the sides. How do we take him? He's working the grease pits, main floor in the rear. Floor manager's got everybody working as usual. Shouldn't be any trouble. Let's go in. Yeah. The uh, grease pits are back that way. Oh, I see him. Which one's wearing? Over on the left. Packing the wheels in that Buick. Young kid. Looks harmless enough. Well, the runners have found out different. Well, I think he spotted us, Ben. Yeah. Try to take him easy. Don't want any shooting in here. We're walking away. Heading for that elevator. Watch it, Pete. Hey, he made it. Yeah. Let's hit that ramp. 
Oh, you might have winged him, Ben. Uh, maybe. Hey, where's that elevator go? All the way up, six floors. That could be tough. If it goes up six floors, it will be. My legs can't take this gaff anymore. Uh, uh, we're lucky, Pete. He's up here on two. Elevator door's open. Yeah. All those cars. It's tough to spot them. Yeah, take that sign. I'll try over here. It's no good, Warren. You're all through. Toss down that gun and come out. I see him, Ben. Back of that yellow Chevy. Better make it easy for yourself, Warren. Toss that gun and come out with your hands over your... You'll never get out alive, Warren. We have men all over the place. Better come out before we go in after you. I'm getting closer, Warren. There'll be no second chance. I'm getting closer. Get him, Pete. Okay, Ben. Uh, call it in, Pete. Yeah. Wonder if Quine ever came up with anything on that cap. <laughs> Lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoners. I call these names. The lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie, with Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Carger, was written by Sidney Marshall, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Parley Bear, Howard McNear, Bob Sweeney, High Everback, Jim Nusser. Herb Ellis, Sidney Miller, Bob Griffin, and Virginia Gregg. The lineup is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. If ever a gal labored too long to land her mate, that gal is Millie, and Millie's mom. There's an unselfish, devoted mother. Does she ever think of herself? No, she's right in there helping Millie get her man. Maybe Millie won't succeed in getting the boss's son, but you'll succeed in laughing when you meet Millie, starring Audrey Totter, Thursday nights on most of these same CBS radio stations. Coverly speaking, and remember, the star's address is the CBS Radio Network. Here's Robert Trout with five minutes of the latest news brought to you by the four dealers of your community. Big in everything but price. That's the all-new Ford. It's your best car buy for 52. You get a huge expanse of windows, including a curved one-piece windshield. You get more usable interior space than in any other low-priced car. And you get a smooth, level ride thanks to Ford's automatic ride control that takes bounce out of bumps, tilt out of turns. See the car that's taken America's heart. See the 52 Ford at your Ford dealers. 
Now your nightly reporter, Robert Trout. The government cracked down tonight, <clears throat> sorry, on the leaders of the Communist Party in the United States, ordering the immediate surrender of eight of them facing deportation and action leading to the possible deportation of ten more. Simultaneously, at the United Nations, Secretary General Trigva Lee was discharging an American employee of the U.N. who refused to tell a Senate subcommittee whether he's engaged in espionage against the United States. Another American employed by the U.N. was suspended on similar grounds and nine others placed on special leave pending a full investigation. The powerful political committee of the United Nations took an unexpected action tonight, voting 51 to 5 for an immediate debate on the touchy Korean question. We have no late report on the fighting in Korea, but the Defense Department in Washington reports 962 American casualties last week, which is the highest toll since July. The latest shots in the political war were fired a few minutes ago by President Truman in Pittsburgh, where he's fighting to win for Governor Stevenson the 36 electoral votes of Pennsylvania, which the president himself lost to Thomas Dewey four years ago. Before an enthusiastic Pittsburgh audience tonight, President Truman said he's glad to see that in recent days, General Eisenhower, speaking in the eastern states, has sounded somewhat less like an isolationist. But, said the president, I cannot trust a man who has played this kind of game with the grave issues of national security. And he urged his listeners to choose a man who maintains his principles under fire, and that is, he said, Governor Stevenson. In upstate New York, General Eisenhower finished a New England tour before enormous audiences with a speech tonight in Troy, where he devoted himself to the subject of the nation's finances. He accused the administration of systematically encouraging inflation and using inflation as a national policy. The general's remedy consists of three steps. One, knocking down the administration idol of cheap money. Two, getting unified action from the government's economic agencies. And three, slicing the fat out of the national budget. And General Eisenhower spoke scornfully of the administration's controls over prices. He said there are nothing but weak stop gaps. Governor Adlai Stevenson is in New York State, too, and we're just getting the reports of his speech in Buffalo, where he said General Eisenhower is guilty of a cruel hoax by holding out hope for the swift release of people who are now enslaved behind the Iron Curtain. And Governor Stevenson went on, It's a great tragedy that the Republican old guard has now succeeded in doing what Hitler's best generals never could do. They have captured General Eisenhower. Two items from abroad. The coalition government of Austria has fallen after seven years of running the country, the members of its various parties unable to agree on a budget for the coming year. And a note from Iran, which has now definitely broken off diplomatic relations with Great Britain. The foreign ministry of Iran borrowed a book from the British embassy in Tehran, a book on the rules to be followed when a nation breaks relations with another. The Iranians borrowed the rule book several weeks ago, and when the British asked for it back last week, the Iranian government said they were still using it. But now the break is official, and Iran should be able to return to the British the book on how to break relations. This is Robert Trout in New York. Now here's Harry Clark for the Ford dealer in your community. Watch the buyers go Ford. Proof that the great new Ford is the standout car of the year. The only completely new car in the low price field. It's the only car in its class to offer a choice of high compression V8 or 6 engines, three great transmissions, 18 beautiful models, and a wide choice of body, upholstery, and color combinations. Visit your Ford dealers tomorrow. Test drive the 1952 Ford, the ablest car on the American road. <laughs> 